Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, scientists in exile. Piu Piu Thin Zaw is a lecturer at Hong Kong University teaching global health. Previously, she was a research scientist and epidemiologist at the Ministry of Health in Myanmar, where there was a military coup in 2021. Dr. Thin Zaw speaks to Dr. Josh Sharfstein about her experience and the experience of physicians and other scientists forced undercover or into exile around the world. Let's listen. Dr. Piu Piu Thin Zaw, thank you so much for joining me on Public Health On Call. Uh, I really appreciate your time, and I think it might help just to start by introducing yourself to our audience. Thank you so much, Dr. George, for inviting me to this uh, very important podcast. So my name is Piu Piu. I am a lecturer at the School of Public Health at Hong Kong University. Before I migrated to Hong Kong, I was a research scientist at the Department of Medical Research, Ministry of Health, Myanmar. Could you um, explain a little bit more about your work at the Ministry of Health in Myanmar? So as a research scientist, I participated in a lot of uh, population surveys focusing on reproductive health, but actually I also participated in some activities at the National Health Plan Implementation Unit, in which we are trying to advocate for the importance of universal health coverage. So that those are really important studies and work uh, to be done. What else was going on in Myanmar that was affecting you at that time? So at that time, it is a very important transition, not only for the health sector, but also in every sector of the country, because we are trying our best to bring equity in health and education. So I would say that when I was working for the Ministry of Health, it is a time full of hope and a very critical transition period. Were there signs of concern to you within the government at that time? I would say yes to that because I am a kind of very um, outspoken person. And even though we have some freedom under the civilian government, I would say that the country political situation is not our liking, our main young generation. So there are so many um, bureaucratic uh, procedures restricting my activities and I'm not very, I was not very happy. So I decided that I would like to go out of the country and see what other people are doing out there so that I could see my potentials. So you're working in the Ministry of Health. There is um, some optimism um, about what could the future hold for the country, but there are also some restrictions on you. Could you just explain a little bit about the restrictions that made you decide to leave Myanmar? So practically, the restrictions are like some positions being taken by some military retired people at that time. Actually, I have written articles on that too before I get out of the country because um, some administrative positions were taken by military descendants that we call that way. So their way of thinking is quite... Uh, bureaucratic, and there is a very tiny room for improvement, especially innovative ideas. So I thought um, it doesn't it didn't work for some time, but also there is hope for us. We are also looking forward to some good future. So at this moment that we're talking about, you know, you decide to leave. And you were in Hong Kong when there is a coup in Myanmar. What was that like to to witness? It it was a very big shock. So 
we were very shocked by the news because it was like on first February we started seeing the uh, social media posts around in the morning and then uh, a lot of people like us across the globe, like we have a Burmese diaspora, we started texting each other. Gosh, is that real or is that a fake news? We are trying to find out if that is real or a fake. And then suddenly we came to realize that that is really happening. And then we were very shocked. Personally, I couldn't sleep for like two days after hearing that news. That, that, that sounds awful, obviously, for, for you and yes. for the country. Um, yeah. I wonder, because you were expressing concern about the role of the military in the Ministry of Health before you left, whether you feel like it would be safe for you to go back. I don't feel safe at all. Can you explain why? Oh, because I don't feel safe to go back after the coup. So um, once the coup started, a lot of people like us who were outside the country started to speak out against the coup because it is just really horrible for the future of the country. So as one of the other people who are against the coup, I also had participated in a lot of public talks discussing about the courts of coup. So because of these activities, I do believe that it is not safe for me to go back home. Um, but I don't know for sure because I didn't try going home at all yet. Yes, I I, I totally appreciate, appreciate that. Um, it sounds like you're not alone among people who left Myanmar and maybe don't feel safe going home. There are a lot of people like that, like these situations, because some of our friends, they they when they started to renew their passports, they were informed that they are already blacklisted. So these students, like professionals, like as scientists, like us, they are already in danger of re revoking their passports. So it is a kind of threat for a lot of diaspora. Uh, Whenever you get involved in any coup activity, your embassies will tell you that or give you some warnings that your passport may not be renewed or something like that. So it is a kind of constant threat because we have only five years in our pass passports. And then after two years, the war starts to forget about us. And then the embassy started to uh, control our activities through this uh method by passport, yeah, our passports. So there could be quite a lot of scientists just for Myanmar alone who are now in different parts of the world and are unsure whether they can return or whether they can remain citizens. So actually my actual concern is not people already outside of the country. My actual concern is the scientists inside the country. So after the coup, there are thousands of scientists who participated in anti-coup activities. So what we call that activity is civil disobedience movement. So scientists like professors walk out of their position showing that they are against the coup. A lot of medical doctors also stopped working for the government. And then these people are now displaced. I mean, their positions are stripped. And then they, some of them are internally displaced. Some of them started to migrate to other countries like in Thailand, but most of them are quite a bit lost, like in limbo. They are staying in the country, but not having their job and not knowing what to do and also and a constant threat. So their situation is quite very worrisome. And it sounds like not only for them, but for the people that they were serving for the work that they were doing, the patients they were taking care of, the projects they were on, the, a lot of that must grind to a halt. That is so true because let me give you an example. According to the World Health Organization, we need one medical doctor for 1,000 or people, right? 1,000 people. Myanmar has very limited medical doctors. We don't have enough doctors, even before the coup. So after the coup, thousands of medical doctors are now hiding 
I mean, literally highly. So you can count one doctor for thousand population, and you can estimate the magnitude of the crisis if you also consider the population being impacted by this uh, situation. So yes, the crisis is quite massive, and also it is not a temporary situation. We need like seven years to get a medical doctor, so. It needs a lot of years to get this population back. So I really think that the health outcome of the whole country will get deteriorated in the very near future, only because these medical doctors are being, you know, um, discriminated or being threatened politically. I know you're working to raise attention to this issue. What what? Does that look like what kind of um, opportunities are there to raise awareness, at least, of this challenge? So the opportunities to raise this awareness is a kind of limited. I didn't know that before because I was thinking that there were there, there were lots of mechanisms, but I was wrong. As far as I concern, there is only one initiative which is focusing on displaced scientists like that, only one. So I participated in this initiative as a member of steering committee and see through the situations. And I was shocked to learn that not only from scientists from Myanmar, but also from scientists, but also scientists from Ukraine or Afghanistan or Yemen, they were also facing the same situation. And also there was there is almost no mechanism in place to rescue them or to place them on the right track so that they can get back to their normal working environment. So my concern is that you may have normal refugee mechanism, but you don't read the war doesn't have a proper channel for scientists, refugee scientists, I would say. I see. And you're both concerned about people who are still in those countries that you mentioned in Yemen, yes. in yes. parts of Ukraine, I'm sure, um, yes. as well as people who have left and now can't use yes. their skills. Like some people are in border areas like camps, United Nations camps. The war has to invest a lot to get that kind of scientists again. So maybe they, there should be proper mechanism for them to go directly from these UN camps or even some international laws protecting this particular population. So the military or whoever shouldn't touch the doctors or scientists. I don't know how to put it because I'm not a law person, but that's what I'm thinking. Is there something that the world scientific community can do to be helpful? Absolutely. So the first thing I think is that the scientific communities, the universities or research institutions, they should create a position for specific refugee scientists. For example, there are policies for gender equality. There are also policies when it comes to discrimination and etc. So if all the universities has position, specific positions to take up refugee scientists across the globe. It would be a lot easier for them to find a job and to continue their important work like research or whatever they are working on. So the world will not lost their uh, benefits and also the home country and the host country will be beneficial in the long term. So I really think that is something uh, scientific communities should be focusing on right now. Yes, so I have some personal stories. For example, one of my friends is trying to get out of the country. He is accepted by a university, but he was he's he's not very sure that he can get out of the country because the passport, may, uh, the airport may not be safe for him to actually go through the immigration, and there is no one to protect him, no mechanism there that he would be safe. And the university cannot do anything for him. In a way, it makes it much harder for 
countries to recover from these challenges if people can't be trained and in yes. caring for others or doing research that's going to be necessary for health? Yes. So there are a lot of hidden costs. And also these costs are huge. Some people may ignore that because, you know, if you lost a person, you lost a person. But if you lost a doctor, you lost a doctor plus another thousand population along with him. And then to get that doctor back, you need next seven years. Well, I um, very much appreciate uh, the the work you're doing to make people aware of this challenge um, and your um, efforts to try to find a way to help your your friends, your colleagues, uh, people that you uh, know, not only in Myanmar, but a- across the world in this terrible situation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Josh, for putting me in this very important podcast and have a good day. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.